gun. You can't fight in here. This is the war room. Shit filters full. Really? Yeah. I always go backwards when I'm backing up. What are you under? Yeah, he's got to do something for a living these days. Diane ain't much of a living boy. You failed to maintain your weapon, son. It's liberty! It, he's hurt! Whiskey, quick. Master, we are here. But what I do have are a very particular set of skills. <laughs> <laughs> Why is mad? Something is going to happen. What's going to happen? Something wonderful. You can call it the art of fighting without fighting. We started a game we never got to finish. I was just fooling about. I wasn't. Why don't you make like a tree and get the fuck out of here? Give me liberty or give me death! <laughs> Good day, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Ernest Emerson Podcast, a podcast where both you and I get to talk with, listen to, and ask questions of some of the most interesting people in the world. We only have one disclaimer. If you are offended by the truth, please go away. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Ernest Emerson Podcast, number six. I'm Ernest Emerson, and I'm here with Danny T. to bring you today's conversation. Good day, Danny. Good day, Ernie. Uh, Today's guest is a very special individual, uh, someone that I have long admired, and I just want to say that uh, he is one of those people that has probably contributed uh, more to the survival and safety of soldiers and uh, police officers and first responders uh, across the nation, uh, actually across the world. Uh, And uh, he's one of those guys that kind of broke out of the box with his new research and everything a few years ago now, but he has continued uh, full steam ahead. And... uh, I guess I could just say uh, he's on a mission, and that mission is to provide information and knowledge to keep our our men in uniform, uh, no matter what color it is or what badge they have on or what patches they wear, to keep those guys safe and sound in the uh, in the heat of battle and in the stress of, of combat. Uh, his name is Colonel David Grossman, and I am very honored to have him here today. But before we get to that... Um, I'm going to start off with some thoughts on something that uh, will lead kind of into uh, what he talks about a lot, which is the psychology of of high stress and what it does to people. And uh, I'm going to talk about condition black. And I'll just start off here. There's been a lot written about Jeff Cooper's color code system and the conditions of awareness. This system has been successfully used by military, law enforcement, and civilians for decades. And basically, the origin of this color code system is that Colonel Cooper deduced that there were levels of awareness that constantly affect us as human beings, and that we are always in one of those conditions. Further, they will definitely affect our ability to survive a life-threatening crisis or event, depending upon which condition you are in at the onset of the event. And in order to teach these conditions by describing them separately and understandably to military recruits during their training, he assigned a color code to each of the four conditions or levels of awareness. In the words of Colonel Cooper, these are the four conditions. Number one, condition white. You are unprepared and unready to take lethal action. If you are attacked in condition white, you will probably die unless your adversary is totally inept. Number two, condition yellow. You bring yourself to the understanding that your life may be in danger and that you may have to do something about it. Number three, condition orange. You have determined upon a specific adversary and are prepared to take action, which may result in his death, but you are still not in a lethal mode. Number four, condition red. You are in a lethal mode and will shoot if circumstances warrant it. 
Now, I've modified that a little bit, my uh, definitions of that, uh, for the classes that we teach and for some of the things that I've uh, lectured uh, to different uh, units and entities over the past few years. So I'm going to go through those conditions one more time. Uh, and these, these uh, definitions are in the words of Ernest Emerson. Number one, condition white. You are awake, but not paying attention to your surroundings or environment. Number two, condition yellow. You are paying attention to your situational awareness, surroundings, environment, and you are aware and assessing others in your vicinity for potential threats to your safety. Number three, condition orange. You have positively identified a threat and are actively formulating a countermeasure and response. Number four, condition red. You are actively responding to the threat, which now has you engaged in combat. This is the fight. Now, as with everything in life, as more is learned, more information garnered, more experience, and more results analyzed, the process of evolution will inevitably occur. And so it is with the four conditions or color cord awareness as developed by Colonel Cooper. As a result of this evolutionary process, enter the fifth condition, condition black. Condition black is the place in a fight, in combat, where you cease to exist. The you that I am describing here is the conscious you, the thinking you, the you that you know. It is in this condition, black, that all cognitive operations cease to register. There is no thinking, no decision-making, no eternal dialogue, no reasoning, no regard for safety, and importantly, no fear. There is no before, there is no after, there is only now. If all thinking and cognitive processes have ceased to function, then there is no capability of judgment. Since nothing can be judged or assigned a value, there is no fear. This is the state of existence described by the samurai warrior as complete disregard for the self. This condition is as close to the pure animal state that a man or woman can ever get. This is, you might say, the state of pure survival instinct. It is the time and place where the lizard brain and our lowest brain functions are now in control. It is the blind rage that some have described after left life and death confrontations. And this creature that emerges has only one goal, survival. In this condition, the creature that now inhabits the human body will do anything to survive and get out of the situation of danger. This is the realm of what I describe as the elemental fighter. I have always believed and long taught that inside all of us is an instinctual fighter, quite literally, our tooth and claw cornered animal self. Fortunately, I guess few of us have ever had to access that being, our dark passenger. And I would say overall that this is a good thing, since it is a testament to the order of our society, our laws, our ethics, and our morals as a whole. I have met my dark passenger, and it is an experience that is pure and powerful, shocking, yet exhilarating, and in the end, alluring and addicting. Perhaps this is why so many love the roller coaster and the out-of-control, wild abandon that it can create. But true condition black is far beyond the effects that a ride on a roller coaster can produce. To be in a pure state of existence where there is only pureness of action, where no thoughts can occur, is an experience that is rarely felt by some and never experienced by most. As I state time and time again in my classes, you never want to experience something for the first time in combat. So it is with Conditioned Black. Can we introduce it in training? Yes, we can and it is always one of the highlights of the course. By creating specific training exercises, you can get a student to experience Condition Black. Now, you can be in a fight, 
a, a real fight and still never leave condition red. In condition red, you are still able to cognitively think, decide, and act. But, given the right or wrong stimulus, whether it is merely an overload of the system or some internal switch that gets tripped, due to a certain combination of psychological buttons being pushed, condition black can be triggered. When you enter condition black, you are still able to fight, physically at least, but it is more like a lashing out in any and all directions. This can cause a negative cascade of problems because you simply don't know what you're doing, and you may end up doing the wrong thing, which can possibly cause more harm than good. And that is never a good thing. Suffice it is to say that one of man's greatest fears, a real gut-wrenching primal fear, is the loss of control. To lose control of your actions, control of your safety, goes against our primal instinct for self-preservation. Whether that loss is to an outside entity, a circumstance, a bad guy, mother nature, or some other cause, your own loss of self-control can put you very close to a conditioned black event. Conditioned black can indeed seem a frightening place to visit. But like all conditioning, once you have been pushed there, not only does it get a little less scary, but the stimuli and circumstances that trigger condition back are pushed a little further back. Your boundaries have now been increased, and as your boundaries are pushed back, you are able to exert more control over that situation for a longer period of time, even in the face of chaos and deadly threat, perhaps never reaching condition black at all. This would be the realm described by many as the calm of combat. Through proper training, enforcing your access and exposure to Condition Black, you have a better chance of engaging in combat where you are still able to exert some control over events to the best of your ability, Condition Red, rather than losing complete ability to control anything, Condition Black. As you may surmise, once you are engaged in combat, it is a far better tactical position to stay in condition red than in condition black. Just knowing that condition black exists is, of course, the first step in training to use it to your advantage. In life or death combat, you need every advantage you can muster to be on your side. These collective tactics and strategies along with your own experiences, may ultimately add up to enough of an advantage to destroy the enemy, ensure your survival, and lead you out of the dangerous darkness and into the safety of light. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it has come to that time. I want to introduce my guest. Uh, he's one of my favorite people. Uh, I'm going to preface this a little bit. Uh, I went to a speech by this man one time uh, quite a few years ago, and I'll tell you what, uh, the only way I could describe it when I talked to people about uh, sitting on a, uh, I was sat right in the front row, uh, it was uh, Lieutenant Colonel David Grossman, it was at a Trexpo show uh, here in Los Angeles, and the only way I could describe it was I said, look, there were times when he was speaking when I wanted to be standing on my seat and cheering and then there was times when I was wiping tears out of my eyes so uh, he's that kind of guy he's he's a, a brilliant man in his field and uh, let's just let's just take it off from there Lieutenant sure. Colonel David Grossman welcome to this uh, podcast I appreciate you taking the time to spend with Curtis us today Emerson, it is my honor and those are those are wonderful words from somebody who's truly one of the great leaders of our time. Say, uh, I call this the warrior renaissance. It's an explosion of knowledge. And, uh, and mm-hmm. you have been the, one of the, the great minds and the great engineers and the craftsmen that have uh, carried us through these times. So it's a privilege, brother, truly enough. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Those are, those are very gracious words. Uh, the, the thing is uh, that I would like to kind of start with dave is uh oh do you mind if i call, what should i address yes, you as and, and, and ernie if i may yes, yes. indeed okay yeah. um the concept of sheepdog 
uh, sheep and wolves. For people that might not have read some of your books or been to your speeches, could you kind of just go into an overview on that that whole concept and how, how you came up with that? Yeah. Well, you know, it was, it was an old Vietnam veteran, an old retired colonel. One sentence from him. I run with it ever since. We have a we have two sheepdog kids books. We It's a major extract from my book on combat. But, you know, the, the basic concept is most people in our society are not wired for violence. You know, they're, they're sheep. They're gentle creatures who only hurt them by accident. And then there's uh, the wolf. And the wolf will feed the sheep without mercy. Uh, if you have no propensity for violence, then you're a nonviolent citizen. If you have a propensity for violence and an absence of empathy, that's a pretty good thumbnail definition for a sociopath, a psychopath, a wolf. But what if you had a propensity for violence and a love for the limbs? What if you spend a lifetime nurturing the capacity for violence and a desire to use it in a righteous battle? Now what do you have? A sheepdog, a warrior. And, uh, and you'd be surprised across years how many people said, you know, this is so powerful to me because I always thought there's something wrong with me. You know, I, I knew I wasn't a wolf. I, I knew you I too. I never hurt the flock, but but I yearn for that righteous battle. I yearn for that opportunity to use my skills at a, at an hour of great need. You know, and uh, and w- in our sheepdog kids book, we talk about how it was a magic moment when people found out they were sheepdogs, like the you know the ugly duckling that, that realizes he's actually going to grow up to be a beautiful swan. You know. And, and, and we wrap up the Sheepdog Kids book by saying, you know, in real life, wolves are not bad. They're part of nature, and dogs can't always save the day. And, and they were born that way, and that's all they're ever going to be. People are different. People can be whatever they want to be. Have you got what it takes to be a sheepdog? And, and I think as a nation, a lot of us have made the decision to walk that sheepdog path, made that decision to come further up that path. Uh, shall issue concealed carry? In 43 states, uh, pre-9-11, who would have ever imagined that? Yeah. Anytime you give up on our nation, just look at that and, and have a little faith. You know, uh, um, people are rising to the challenge. California, county by county, they're firing the sheriffs over uh, over concealed carry and electing sheriffs. Uh, uh, w- these next elections, we may see something amazing happen in California. The political tension is building over time. Um, I, you can't really paint me red or blue. I'm a, I'm a pretty hardcore libertarian. Leave me alone. I'll leave you alone. I, I think the dominant libertarian issue is the right to protect our loved ones, protect ourselves, our Second Amendment. Whenever two out of, you know, there's there's conservative and there's liberal and then there's libertarian. Whenever two out of three are on the same side, it's almost unstoppable. And the whole gun dynamic fits that qualification. Mm-hmm. Uh, California, if you live in Sacramento, Bakersfield, or Fresno, uh, you'll get a, a concealed care permit, shall issue. And you can carry it downtown yeah. San Francisco. But the guy in San Francisco and L.A. never carried down. Now, the guy from Fresno can carry downtown, but the guy from L.A. can't. Can now, I? tell me about creating political tension. And I hope we'll see that tension play out these next elections. I hope so, because, man, we need, we need all the help we can get. Well, I, I think you're right, and I, I think that one of the big things that we as conservatives, and I'm a libertarian too, I've f- kind of found that out as I kind of figured out what is a libertarian uh, and learned uh, about that. Um, the my definition of myself would would fit into that uh, you know that mold, but I think that we don't as people, and I'm not I'm not speaking for you, but as a conservative, let's say. I don't think we realize there's so many of us and that we yes. are ready yes. to, yeah. Yeah, we're patriots. We're drowned yeah. out, yeah. yeah. And, 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 and we place our nation first and our family and our rights. We dedicate ourselves to, uh, to our, 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 our family and, and, and our God, if you're focused that way, and, yep. and to a higher cause. You know, uh, and, uh, and, and this is, this is a, a great way to be. We're sheepdogs in it. In violent times. Well, it's funny you you said that. It, it is a great way to be, and and I I had to recognize reconcile myself to this because uh, I'm getting some feedback, uh, Danny. Excuse me for one second. That's all right. Don't know where it's coming from, yeah. but what I was going to say uh, is I had to reconcile myself to what you said earlier. I thought there was something wrong with me. I, I really, really yeah. thought. If a psychologist or a psychiatrist was going to analyze me, they'd say, "Man, this guy's got some screws loose." Because I like violence, and and I have been a fighter and a 
hard contact sports guy my whole life. I am. I have always viewed myself uh, as the guy who stepped in when a bullying was taking place and things like that. Yeah. And I thought for a long time, I, I thought there was something wrong with me. And, and I got to tell you, I had an epiphany, and it happened at a class. I was back in Minneapolis, and one of the guys in class was one of the Rangers that was uh, in the Black Hawk Down in, in Somalia. Uh, oh. And... In the middle of the class, or at the end of the class, we always go through and ask people, you know, what did you take away? What did you like? What did you not like? What do you think we can prove on? And he stood up and he said, you know, he goes, I like violence. That's something that I just can't get out of my life. And and here was a a, a squared away guy who was a super patriot. Uh, you know, he was a, a good soldier. He was a ranger. Uh, you're a ranger. Uh cool. You got it. So uh, I heard him say that, and I go, you know what? This guy's proud of, of that. He's not looking at it as a deficit. And I was like, hot dang, so am I. And, and, yeah. and from that point forward, I realized that, that that's just the way I am. Now, i got to ask you a question. Uh, when we talk about the sheepdogs, because some people are going to misread that and say, well, only the warriors have courage. And the sheepdogs are the, are, the, are the cowards, so to speak. But I don't think that's what you're defining, is it? And you know what? What we say is the sheep will die to protect the ones they love. You know, most of us are not wired for violence, but there's one major exception. Um, mama bear protecting her cubs is one of the most dangerous things on the planet. I keep running into women who say, "I wouldn't fight for my own life, but I would die for my children's life." Oh yeah. You know, hardwired dynamic. But we got to convince them that your life is every bit as valuable as any other life on the planet. You have every right to fight for your life as well as your child's life. And when, when we tell them that, we're pulling them down that sheepdog path. Mm -hmm. Now, there is no definitive, you know, it, it's, a, it's a set of degrees. It, we all live in various ends of the spectrum. But, but I tell you, a lot of our, our, uh, our, our sheepdogs are, are moving from protecting their own loved ones to protecting others. Uh, and, you know, across America, we see armed educators uh, teachers who are willing to fight and die for their for their oh, children. Absolutely. Other, uh, we we understand that the sheepdogs have courage. The sheep have courage too. They will fight for their loved ones, you know, and they will fight for their children. They don't have the skills. They don't have the ability necessarily to be successful in that fight. There you go. But they will fight protecting their loved ones. The sheepdog starts moving them in that other direction and giving them the skills to protect their little ones. Like I said, we've got uh, our first Sheepdog Kids book is, uh, uh, has been real successful. It's on Amazon.com, Sheepdogs Made America's Warriors. But it was primarily military and law enforcement focused. It mm -hmm. mentioned civilian. But, you know, I present at the NRA every year. I present at other conferences. And people said, Dave, what about all us civilian Sheepdogs? So our second book was Why Mommy Carries a Gun. <laughs> i got to get that one. I don't have it. My wife carries. <laughs> Oops, maybe I shouldn't say that here in California. <laughs> or Dad, Grandma, Grandpa's going to carry a gun. Here's what we wanted to know. You know, uh, the, the four universal gun safety laws, you find a gun, stop, don't touch, get an adult. And what we're really proud of is the historical examples of sheepdogs in the back. We talk about Second Amendment. We talk about... Uh, about historical sheepdogs throughout our history, and and uh, and I, I I think we really hit a home run with that one too, and, and it's all about nurturing people further up that sheepdog path, and and I tell you something too, Artie. You know I, I teach cops in all fifty states. So I I train every federal agency. Uh, I retired from the army twenty one years ago. Uh, last year is on the road two hundred and ten days, and that was one of the lightest years I've ever had, uh, and. I, I'm the, the guest criminal justice professors at universities. Uh -huh. And what I tell people is our whole measure of criminal justice is completely flawed. When we look at crime, oh, the murder rate. Well, the thing to understand is the murder rate's being held down by medical technology. The docs are saving ever more lives every year, just like on the battlefield. Is, yes, that, indeed. Not, is that not intuitively obvious? You know, not, to have, not to some. Not to some. Vietnam level technology. The, the number of kids mur killed in the current war would be many times what it is. If oh, we had yeah. World War II technology, the number of kids killed in this war would be would be a thousand times what it is. Yes, it would. So every day the docs are saving ever more lives. And when we look at the number of people murdered in America, for over a decade, the number of people murdered came down almost every year, just 
down, 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 down. And then in the last two years, the murder rate has exploded like nothing we have ever seen in the history of our nation. And the, the FBI calls it the Ferguson effect. They say we've created a sense of anger in our criminals. Like somehow the criminals are the good guys and the cops have bad yeah. guys for important law. And, and, you know, I'm an old geezer, 61 years old. Maybe I lost it. <laughs> I was not your criminal. You live your life in fear. You're a criminal. You've broken the laws of society. All of society is out to get you. We got whole states that say, well, we're sanctuary states. You don't have to obey the law in our state. We're sanctuary cities. You don't have to obey the law in our city. And, and, and they do enormous harm to the fabric of our civilization by saying you don't have to obey the law. Yeah. Yeah. You know, just, you know, lawlessness is, is, is contagious. And what we've got is this explosion of criminals who truly believe the cop's the bad guy. Every year, cops have better body armor, better tactics, better training, better medical technology. So the only good measure of the problem, if cops murdered, is the year-over-year increase in cops murdered. In 2016, was the single worst year-over-year increase in cops murdered in the history of our nation. Five cops murdered in Dallas, four cops murdered in uh, in Baton Rouge, onesies and twosies across America. Uh, the, the, the left has really declared this war on cops. I know. It's yeah. totally counterproductive and destructive to the fabric of our civilization. You know, I, I, I don't get it, Dave, and, and it's, it's one of those things that I think uh, is, again, the fact that they shout the loudest. Because, no. for example, you said that about breaking the law. Let's say that I go in front of a, a, a school class and I talk about things. And one of the things I, I will mention is, you know, you follow the rules. You don't break the law. You'll never have a lot of, of trouble if you're a law-abiding citizen uh, and things like that. And then they go home at night and they turn on the, the TV and they find the, the mayor of San Francisco or something uh, literally saying, I'm telling you to break the law. Uh, I, it's and they're not you know and and, and again our, we're a nation of immigrants yeah. and our forefathers came here legally and they they came here and they became a part of our nation invested in our laws uh you know when when the first act you do when you come to the nation is break the law and the hispanic community is strongly supportive of strong borders oh, yeah. the ones who came here and played by the rules are strongly supportive of playing by the rules when your first act is to come to our nation and break the law and then be told that that's okay. You know, I had a guy tell me one time, you know, I, um, I you know, we, we don't have illegal aliens. We have undocumented aliens. Well, <laughs> I have an illegal gun. I have an undocumented gun. <laughs> <laughs> I guess you could apply that word. <laughs> All of a sudden, we don't like it. You know, you don't get to choose which laws to disobey. That's we exactly are, right. We are a, a nation of, of armed citizens who are entrusted with deadly force to protect our loved ones and protect others. I, I believe that, that truly there are only a handful of truly free nations on the planet. Switzerland, yeah. Israel, ourselves. Yeah. There's only a handful of nations where the people are truly armed and free. And, and it is a battle against socialism, which is just another face of communism, as, as we strive to remain an armed nation and we strive against socialism, uh, you know, look at Venezuela, see how socialism is working out for them. You know, yeah. Margaret said uh, socialism is just fine until you start running out of other people's money. You know, and, how uh, true that is. Venezuela right now, see how that's turning out. Yeah. But this is what they, the left wants to feed us, is this so socialist nanny state. Uh, I, I believe, first and foremost, if any politician doesn't think I can be trusted with the tools to protect my loved ones, then that politician does not deserve to be in power. And, and, and I think whether you're liberal, conservative, or, 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 or libertarian, you can find a consensus on this. Are we worthy of the trust of our nation? Are we worthy as citizens to be trusted and to, to govern ourselves? If not, give up on the idea of democracy. If we cannot be trusted to care for ourselves, if we're children who need a nanny state, then give up on the very idea of democracy. And that's in the end where this socialist movement is headed. And well, all you sheep dogs out there, believe in who you are. Believe in what you do. Stay strong to our nation. Stay strong to our causes. And uh, the sheep dog kids books are all about that that dynamic. Well, and, uh, and I think we've made a great contribution. I, I any contribution like that 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 gives an example to our young people is a great contribution. 
And, you know, I've always said one thing when I, when I speak to people. I say, uh, one of the quotes I use is, a man who stands by his convictions never stands alone. And, you know, that's something that I think a lot of these young people miss. Now, I've got a 16 or 17-year-old, and I've got to tell you something about sheepdogs. Now, uh, he's grown up in our family, and we, we run in a, a, a pretty uh, rough crowd, if you will. And I don't mean that uh, uh, in a dark way. I just mean a lot of military guys, police officers, etc. So they've grown up with a lot of uh, outside role models besides just me and, and, and my wife, Mary. In fact, my my wife said to say hello to you today, uh, David. So, uh, hello. Yeah. you know, teaching adult supervision. The difference between us and the Boy Scouts is the Boy Scouts have adult supervision. You know. So. Well, there you go. So anyway, I was going to say that, uh, you know, I I noticed something about him, and he and he's uh, one day was going to go to the mall with his friends, and he said, "Dad, can I go to the mall with my friends?" And this mall that he wanted to go to is uh, it, it, there's some crime there. They have police stationed at the mall actually because there's petty robberies and there's been some dark things happen over the years and we were a little hesitant and i said son i don't know and he was going with uh, two two boys that were going and then three girls and uh i said geez i don't know son if you can go today or not and this is what he said to me spontaneously he said dad who is going to protect them and i was like oh my god that's one of the that is one of the finest things I've ever... I, I couldn't be more proud of hearing that from my son. I've got to go with him. Who I mean, else is going to protect him? Yeah. They need me. Here you is know, a sheepdog going yes. on right in my Your my soul. son. Yeah, and uh, The sheepdog right there. i got to go. Yeah, maybe it's foolish, but who else is going to protect him? Yeah, <laughs> he saw himself as the protector, and I thought, that, oh, that's wow. That's the Saharasim on my arms right now, because that's the definition of the sheepdog. It, it is. You know? He's got a blade. I bet he's got skills. I bet he's, uh, you know, he's, yeah. he's the kind of person you would want yeah, to yeah. have protecting your loved ones. So, yeah, and and I'm proud of that. I'm very proud of it. Uh, in fact, he'll be training. We we have a gym right here. The the Hoist Gracie uh, uh, Jiu Jitsu School is right on the on this wall behind me. And he'll be here tonight. He trains uh, twice a week with them. And so he's <laughs> he's after the skills. So. Let me mention something else to you and all your awesome listeners out there. Um, you know, you talk about the martial arts. I grew up in the martial arts. I love the martial arts. I turned 18. I enlisted in, you know, as a paratrooper. And, uh, and my martial art became the rifle and the pistol. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I'd heard for years about the martial art of the firearm. And your listeners uh, make, find value in this. You know, uh, um, when I talk to my cops... <laughs> I give them two case studies and decide now which one you're going to keep. The first one is the uh, Pulse nightclub, 49 day. There was a cop on duty in the parking lot. The official Orlando report says uh, uh, the police officer said, I, I heard a rifle. I had a pistol. I chose not to go in. Now, what would it feel like to spend the rest of your life? No, 49 people died while you sat outside with a gun. And did nothing. Not not only not only as a citizen, but as a cop. Yeah. You know, the, the cop at Parkland that didn't go in is being sued. I think your chance this cop would be sued. But then then the killer, don't don't ever call them shooters. We're shooters. They're murderers. Right. There's all the difference in the world. Yep. The killer, the murderer, pops out and murders two people who are trying to escape. Right? Pops out of an exit, right there in the parking lot, kills two people, and brings the cop under fire. Now, the cop's behind a vehicle. The vehicle's riddled with bullets. Uh, the report I got, the cop fired most of the magazine from less than 30 feet away and didn't hit once. Wow. And the one didn't go in. You know, he had no skills. He had no ability. The other case study I give people is the Draw the Prophet Muhammad Art Festival in Garland, Texas, in May of 2015. Draw the Prophet Muhammad Art Festival. Could they yep. be more provocative? It was their right to do it. They were afraid to draw bad guys, and it did. Two art critics from Arizona showed up with AK-47s and body armor. <laughs> they had body armor. They had rifles. They yeah. had the element of surprise. There were two of them. Yep. They rolled up the vehicle, and a 59-year-old traffic cop with a pistol killed them both. It was an incredible act. Of, his name is Officer Greg Stevens. I, I, I used a photograph of him with President Obama hanging a medal around his neck. Well, I'll be there. Which one get you spend the rest of your life knowing you cowered outside while 49 people were murdered. 
Are you going to stand there with the president and put in a middle round and do that? It's about training. Yeah. It's about seeking training, developing our skills. And, you know, when you and I were kids in the 1970s, uh, 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 the World War II veterans were running the show. Yeah, they were. World War II veterans and every police department had a pistol team. And every police department, the sheriff, the chief, the sergeants, the captains, they were veterans. They were veterans, yeah. They honored the guy on the pistol team more than anyone else. And back then, they were just doing bullseye shooting. Not, not the tactical stuff during the day, but they knew those skills transferred. And, uh, and, and the thing of it is today, go back to the martial arts. Uh, today, one, one report tells us 20 million Americans are the martial arts. Only a couple thousand compete. The idea of being on a pistol team, the idea of competing, most Americans just are not invested in that. But striving for your next belt, striving against yourself, against the standard, mm-hmm. the, the martial arts, the dojo, the structure, Americans love that. So the martial art of the firearm is uh, hojutsu, uh, H-O-J-U-T-S-U. Uh, yep, yep. uh, Jeff Hall. Uh, uh, a founder of, of Jiu-Jitsu, the most decorated Alaska State Trooper, a, a ranger, Vietnam ranger, right at the very end of the wall, mm-hmm. or a, a high-level martial artist of multiple skills, one of less than 30 grandmaster pistol shots on the planet, and he resurrected the art of the firearm. And I thought it was good. I'm a gun sight grad, a front sight grad, a little competitive shooting, mm-hmm. a little military instruction. Uh, I showed up and... Uh, Barely qualified brown belt in my first three. Days. <laughs> I trained for two years to make my black belt. I knew what shots I was missing. There's one caught at the black belt level. It's got uh, three weapons retention moves built into it. It's got transition from armed to unarmed fire. Yep. At one point in the combat, you smack the bad guy with your gun. Come on, you got a chunk of steel in your hand. Smack yeah. him with it. You know, it, and it's it, a weapon uh, without it, firing. It, yeah. And, and the idea of striving for the next belt for all you sheep dogs out there. I, I think that uh, we're seeing the Hujutsu Dojo's taken off nationwide. Uh, think about going to that, the website, hujutsu.com, Hotel Oscar Juliet Uniform Tango Sierra Uniform.com, and, uh, and, uh, and, and find one of the, the three day weekends at dojos across the nation. Show up, get some of the best training we ever have. Now, Jeff Hall's uh, practitioners, mm-hmm. uh, over 20 have been in real world gunfights. And they have a little over 99% hit ratio in real-world gunfights, yep. which is just matched by anybody else out there. Mm-hmm. So it recognize the fact that as a nation, we're, we're striving for those standards. And here's one of those things that's out there. It's pulling our sheep dogs up to that next level. Are, are you going to – it's not enough to have the gun. Although, you know, don't be a gun snob. Say, oh, you got to fire a 1,000 rounds a month or we'll take your, your license away. No, 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 don't do that. Grandma with a revolver in the bedside stand is a force to be right. Yeah, that's pretty formidable uh, force. But, but, you know, uh, my great-grandmother in New Orleans in the 1930s uh, shot a bad guy off the second floor back balcony. Well, you know, summer, New Orleans, you know, the, all the doors and windows are open on yep. the second floor. And a guy climbs up on the second floor balcony and starts coming in. Granny probably never fired more than 20 rounds in her life. To the ultimate point-and-click interface. She <laughs> <laughs> and pulled the trigger. The bad guy went away. She must hit at least once because uh, there was a blood trail out in the alley in the morning. But Grandma with a with a revolver in the you know in in England, uh, home invasions are very common. You'd oh, be yeah. tough with a couple of clubs or knives. Kick down the door. What are they going to do? Yeah, they know and no one's there. armed. Uh, yeah, and when people are home, they, they'll invade your home while you're there. They have no fear. Yeah. What are you going to do to them? Uh, you know, he's a great big guy. What, what are you and I going to do without a knife, without a gun? What's yeah. the average person going to do when a gang comes in your door? In America, that home invasions are incredibly rare. They try very hard to find a time when the house is empty. And, and the point of all that is that, uh, you know, grandma with a revolver in the bedside stand is truly a force to be reckoned with. But once you... Start carrying the gun. Strive to be ever better. It's not enough to have the gun. It's not enough to be brave. You got to be good. And yeah, it's, it's it's not going to shoot all by itself. You you have to be the vehicle that delivers yeah. those rounds. And you know, again, I think people misunderstand something. They um, they think of it as a panacea almost that yeah. it's gonna it's gonna go where they point. And you know, never having been in a stress environment. And again, what's one of the things I took away from your books that was so uh, enlightening that you had actually put everything down 
in a, in a cohesive uh, package about what happens to a human being under stress and all that. Unless you train at those levels, uh, you don't know what it's gonna, what you're gonna do, and how you're gonna react. You you can't heart. There's no way to know it unless you feel it. And uh, wow, this is interesting to me because I, I'm totally unaware of what you're describing the hojutsu uh, training. I'm I'm gonna have to check that out. I, I, you will love it. It'll rock your world. All you good sheepdogs out there, you know, we're all trying to come further up that path. There are no mm-hmm. ultimate sheepdogs. There are no ultimate sheep. There's people up and down that continuum. Yep. And we're all striving to come further up that path to, to further develop our skills. And, you know, I, I know, you know, uh, I'm on the road. I, I, I'll be in planes uh, five, six days a week. Mm-hmm. I I, 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 I'll fly into, you know, the People's Republic of New Jersey, you know, I, I, I'll fly into <laughs> Canada, my flight will get diverted. I'll, out on the road like that, unless I have a friend on the ground that can loan me a gun, I usually do not have a gun, but I always have a knife. When I'm home, yeah. when I'm home, I got my clothes on, I got a gun on. Yeah. But uh, but I, I've, I've always got a knife, and, uh, and that's the one thing you can always do. And, and, and I tell all my cops, all my sheepdogs, be ashamed. You know, my knife is in my check bag. My Emerson sheepdog knife is in my check bags. And uh, the first thing I do, I go to my check bags. I, I put my knife in my pocket. Uh, be ashamed to, to not have a knife on you. It's a minimum. Well, you know, it goes further than just being a defensive weapon, too, because uh, two times in my uh, adult life, we've had to use a knife. One was me and one was my wife, actually, but I was with her. Uh, one was a kid who was caught in a in, uh, an escalator, uh, and we popped him loose with just a, a, a cut of the knife. Uh, the second one was uh, an overturned car, and there was literally, it was like something out of the movies. There was gasoline dripping all over. Uh, I didn't see sparks coming out like they do in the movies, but uh, we knew we had to get her out, and she was hung upside down, and my wife grabbed her. She went in through one of the, uh, the passenger side window. I came through the... Uh, uh, the driver's side window uh, because it was blown out and I cradled her and then my wife whipped her knife out and boom boom cut those seat belts and we, we got her out and uh, so you know it, it isn't just about a weapon oh, you know I envy you that opportunity what we just happen to be there I wish I could do that I want the opportunity <laughs> to do that you know, the, sheep, the sheep bred that day the sheepdog lived for that day. Oh, yeah. You know, yearn for that opportunity to be able to do that. Well done to you and your, well, your awesome you. bride. You know, that's what it's all about. Well, you know, I'll be honest with you. My wife is, uh, she's a heck of a sheepdog, too. Yeah, cool. <laughs> I'll tell you a yeah. quick story. This is one of those uh, that. Uh, you know, as we talk about coming up that sheepdog path, it, mm-hmm. you know, and, like you said, the book on combat, it's issued in the DEA Academy, issued in the Marshals Academy. Yep. Yeah. Marine Corps Commandant required reading, the Army or the, the Navy Master at Arms program uh, required reading, recommended reading for the Army and the Air Force, and uh, translated in five languages. And it's been such an honor, Ernie, to be able to put a tool in the hands of people out there that uh, that will allow them to be forewarned and forearmed about the things that happen and the things we can do about uh, controlling those dynamics. Well, uh, I'll tell you, the when you said that, I was going to bring that up, and I'm glad you touched on it, because... One of the things that I think that you will carry uh, proudly to your grave, that you may not even be aware of it to the extent that, that it has happened, is how many people you have made safe, how many lives you have saved, how many soldiers you, you have uh, um, made a better soldier and allowed them to come home to their families after, after war. Uh, that there's no i mean it's it, it must be a great feeling dave and I, i'm telling you i i recognize it put in the hands of our guys overseas as oh, our sharp and iron, brother. you know all of us sheepdogs are there doing what we can to make the world a better place and the same back at you brother with the tools and the skills that you're disseminating that, again you. i call this a warrior renaissance uh, we, we've learned more about the psychology and physiology of combat in the last 50 years than the previous 5,000 years put together. I mean, we're 500 years mm-hmm. of gunpowder combat, and nobody told us the shots will be muted in combat. How could we have had gunpowder for 500 years? Yeah. 
the average hunter will tell you, yeah, you know, when I shoot a deer, I don't hear the shot, my ears don't ring. Well, why have we not disseminated that information far and wide? Well, we're just now doing these things. And you and I, we're part of that renaissance. You know, you know, it, 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 when they had the original renaissance, they didn't even call it that for a while. They didn't even know what it was. Just things were happening. And the, the peasant in the field, nothing changed for them. Yeah. But the people who were influencing this, that's, that's you and I. The shakers and the movers, yeah. We're part of this renaissance. We're, we're influencing behavior and, and absorbing this knowledge, this life-saving knowledge for these horrendously violent times. And we so desperately need it. Well, uh, let me ask you then, uh, where did you start this journey? What, what put you on this path to, uh, to get where we are today? I mean, we well, you know it was, uh, it was 1974 and let's say the 82nd Airborne Division. And uh, within uh, 22 months, I was a young buck sergeant. Uh, back in those days, that was, that was common. Thank yeah. goodness it's not the norm now. <laughs> uh, and, uh, but, you know, those were bad days. The Hollow Army, the, 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 the druggies ran the barracks. Uh, uh, those were bad days. We don't realize how bad it was in that post-Vietnam era. And oh. Ronald Reagan became president, turned it around. But we had Vietnam veterans all around us. And uh, we wanted to know what war would be like. And they wouldn't say. It was like this taboo topic. Yeah. There's only one few times we could ever even get them to talk us through some combat narrative of what actually happened. And, uh, and so, and I did, fast forward, uh, I, uh, I, I got a two-year degree to go to OCS. Mm-hmm. Army gave me 18 months to finish off my four-year degree, basically military history. And... Uh, um, all I've ever done since I was 18 to get up and beat my head against a big green wall. You know, I, yeah. I didn't know there was any other life. And, uh, and then the Army gave me 18 months as a young captain to go to school. I said, well, this is awesome. I, I, I'm oh, yeah. And so I decided that I was going to get graduate school on the Army's time. I, mean, I was just focused to do everything I could to the best of my ability. Yep. And I got accepted to teach at West Point as wow. a, in the strike department. Psychology. I, 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 I'm, I'm an army ranger. I'm a <laughs> what, no stinking psychology. So I, I thought, you know, if I'm going to study psychology, I'm going to study the psychology of the battlefield. These stories that these guys wouldn't tell us. Yeah. You know, when I enlisted, I went to the library and looked for the book that would tell me what it's going to be like. And that book didn't. It wasn't there. And, and, and I thought, I'm going to write that book. <laughs> The kind of person who would be a psychologist would never have studied this topic. And the kind of person who studied this topic would never be a psychologist. The Army, the army pounded a square peg into a round hole, you know, <laughs> and this is what you get. My first book was on killing. And, and I really thought the secret of combat was about killing. And, uh, and it was a good book, an important book. Uh, uh, it, it talks about the, the vast majority of people are not wired to kill and healthy people have to be trained to kill. Yep. Uh, Oh, by the way, the video games doing the exact same thing to our kids. Oh, I, I want uh, to talk about that in a minute. So, uh, On Killing sold half a million copies, translated to eight languages, Marine Corps Commandants Required Reading. But what I realized as I, as I began to present uh, to military and especially law enforcement, you know, pre-9-11, the only people in combat every day were law enforcement. And I was trained in uh, Texas Rangers, trained in LAPD SWAT. Mm-hmm. And, and I realized that, that for those who fully prepare themselves, killing is just not that big a deal. A lot of people feel bad they don't feel bad. You know, if you yeah. could choose how you felt about it, I think you'd want to feel good about it. You know, a righteous uh, use of deadly force. You save people's lives. You save your own life. You did your job. I think if you choose how you feel, you'd want to feel good about it. And a lot of people feel bad they don't feel bad. Well, what I realized was what was really messing people up was all the other stuff. You know, the slow motion time, the auditory exclusion, the tunnel vision. And by the way, the bad guy has tunnel vision, too. Oh, yeah. And every draw should have a sidestep built into it. In jiu every we practice sidestep with every draw. Yep. And, and we know that in, in our force-on-force engagements or simulation, the first time you do it, it's almost like combat. And we know if we do a sidestep, we come right up his radar screen. The bad guy yep. has tunnel vision, too. So, uh, and then the things that happen afterwards. You know, uh, uh, when uh, you re-experience the event, that is not PTSD. It, it can become PTSD. Mm-hmm. The path to healing is to remember it without reliving it. 
Uh, but, you know, every time you remember it, you relive it. You know, you're moving down the path of PTSD, depending on how you deal with that. Mm-hmm. So that was that was on combat. Well, on com- let me ask you, though, uh, that seems like a fine distinction between reliving and remembering. How, how would you recommend someone to deal with separating those two things? That's, that's really important, because what we're talking about is reliving it, is when you get a heart rate goes up. And you're, you, you start to become, uh, your body goes into, the, into this, this amazing set of, of responses. Let, let's talk about what the body does in response. Mm-hmm. You know, in males, the scrotum sucks up. The, uh, the, the vasoconstriction sets in. I, I have a photograph of used in my class of Christopher Amoroso, a police officer on 9-11, carrying, basically carrying this, this pregnant lady down. And her face is beet red, and his face is bone white. Yeah, and uh, and their their heart rates exactly the same. You know, their heart rate could be exactly the same. The Im- impact on the body is exactly the opposite. Yeah. She's just yeah, she's done. Yeah, he's going back, and his body has shut down the blood flow to the outer layer of the body. It's called basal constriction. Oh yeah. I tell my cop, don't worry so much about the guy that's red with rage. You watch out for the one that's white with rage. And, uh, and he's done this before. The- Oh, yeah, oh, and, and, and the, the colon can spasm shut. You know, we have a toxic waste site in every human body. It's the colon. It's filled with toxic stuff, and it's under pressure. If there's trauma to the colon, that stuff will leak out and infect the wound. And prior to modern medication, you're dead. So it's very reasonable for the body to dump that toxic waste. Mm-hmm. Just like the scrotum sucks up, the colon can it can suck up and, and almost spasm shut yep. and attack that toxic waste. Uh, a large ratio of people in life and death events mess themselves. Oh, yeah. And they're they're devastated by it. Oh, yeah. I, mean, I, I, I train EMS people. I trained 300 EMS in Maine a little while back. And I told them, you tell people, that's your body's natural response. It happens all the time. Don't worry about it. Yeah. You can literally save somebody's life by telling them that. So here's the body going through this catastrophic series of events, uh, uh, you know, in preparation for this life and death event. Uh, the, you know, the outer layer of the body can, as long as you don't hit the artery or the body core, you won't bleed out in the heat yep. of battle. Uh, you know, you, you, you know, the, like I said, the scrotum sucks up, the, the, the toxic waste is ejected from the, the, even if you don't lose it, you have what we call the pucker factor. Oh, yeah. The pucker factor, when one part of your body is trying to hold in, but another part of the body is trying to eject, you know? And, uh, <laughs> That's and, a conflict. And, and, <laughs> and, and so people have to be warned about this stuff yeah. and, and be informed about this stuff. And, you know, uh, the uh, World War II veterans who, you know, the one inkling of where they're coming from. So I'll, I'll watch a war movie when they see people shit themselves, you yeah. know. And where's that guy coming from? What, what baggage has he got? Nobody ever told him. It's okay. Yeah, it, It's very common. And, and, of course, nobody wants it to happen. The way we prevent it from happening is stress inoculation and breathing. And yep. Once we understand what the body does, then we'll begin to understand how to bring the body under control. And the things we can do that hopefully reduce those those catastrophic events from happening. Well, and that's I, uncommon. You know, it, it, it's funny when you bring that up about uh, uh, the ejection of the toxic waste. Yeah. I think part of that might have to do with just, for example, just the phrase that we've all heard our entire lives. It scared the the shit out of him, or scared the shit yeah. out of me. Yeah. It, it's it's a negative uh, connotation that's been drilled into us. Oh, yeah. that's that's a sign of cowardice. And, and yeah. it's not. And, and I, I got to tell you a story. One of my buddies was a uh, he was a, a he, he didn't make it through buds, but he, he legitimately went through two separate times, but was legitimately DQ'd because of a, he blew his knee out both times. They got him repaired. Second time, catastrophic failure on the knee. So, it, it, you know, a lot of guys DQ and, and they have a medical well, uh, reason. And a lot of times it's really not. But where I'm going with it is this was one tough ombre. And uh, he, he got into uh, MMA fighting at one time, and he was telling me, geez, Ernie, I've got to, get, I've got to fight this guy. Uh, you know, he, he's actually an ex-con, and he was supposedly killed some guy before he went. That's why he went to jail and all this. And, and this, my friend's name was Derek, Derek Russell. And, uh, I mean, this guy was, he was the man you'd want to be, you know what I'm saying, or the man you'd want your son to be. And... Uh, he was at my house. We were talking. He used to work for us, and uh, he said, "Man, I get all jittery. I'm like, I'm like, my stomach's upset, and all this and that." And and I looked at him and I said, "Derek, 
Derek, are you th he said, I think I'm a, a wussy. And I said, Derek, Derek, your body is just preparing for the fight. That's all that's going on. You're getting ready to fight this guy. You're just misreading the signs. And he was like, damn, no. you are right. And, and it's that whole thing. It's stigmatized. People don't understand it. This guy should have, yeah. you know, I mean, he went through some stuff with the guys, but he still didn't have a grasp on it. You know, we talk about stage fright. One musician mm -hmm. says, oh, my stomach knots up and, 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 and my heart is pounding and, 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 and I'm so terrified. The other one says, my heart is pounding and, 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 and my guts are Let me go. <laughs> Let me go. The exact same thing is happening to two different people. Yeah. It, it's how well, they process it. Yeah. That, 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 that is what matters. Yeah. Ah, yeah. We, we live in amazing times and we can well, start informing people about that. It is an amazing time. Now, I want to ask you now, um, let's, let's shift over to uh, the video games. Uh, yeah. Because when I, when I saw you, you mentioned, uh, when I went to the first uh, talk that you gave, you mentioned the video games. And I'm not kidding. Uh, that was in the spring. And we were going on summer vacation about two or three weeks later. And at that time, we let, I let my son and, and my, I have three kids. Uh, they were a little bit older, so they were a little bit out of it. But my son was starting to play the video games, and I was like, "Man, I don't, I don't know. I don't think this is a good idea." After what I heard uh, uh, Colonel Grossman talk about, my wife and I discussed it, and uh, but we really didn't do anything. But when we went back, I, I live in, I came from northern Wisconsin, and we have a cabin back there that's on a lake, and it's pretty much off the grid. There's no TV or anything, and uh, so we went back there, and my son couldn't play video games. And you had said it takes about three days to decompress and let that brain turn off those switches. He was, he was probably 10, 11 years old, barely talked to us outside. Of, I'm hungry. After three days, we were having some of the best conversation I'd ever had with my son. And I was like, holy smokes, this guy was dead freaking on. This exactly happened. It was three days later. He became my son again. And so from that point forward, we have, we have, he gets to, he's 17 now. He gets one hour on Saturday to play his video games. But we have been, uh, my wife more than me, but she's been on it since then. Let me give it, let's start off and then we'll zoom in. Yeah. Um, to tell you where we're headed, the president uh, brought me into the White House for his roundtable. I saw on, that. On video games after the Parkland Master. I'll tell you about that in a minute. I really was neat. But, um, uh, let's zoom out for a minute. We live in an environment of profoundly sleep-deprived civilization. And the video games, you know, there's millions of people online right now. And the video games have got a, an online uh, interactive feedback loop, constantly refining feedback loop to make them, one thing, more addictive. So we have oh, yeah. a million people online, and we do this. And 10% say, oh, it's a good time to save the game and quit. They don't ever do that again. And we do this, and nobody quits. We do more of that. Yep. So it's this constant interactive feedback. The right frequency, the right flicker rate, the right colors, the right design, the right actions to make those things as addictive as humanly possible. Mm -hmm. and, and one video game, Grand Theft Auto V, made more money than the entire global music industry. Oh. One video game made more money than every rock concert on the planet. Every musician, every CD, every download on the planet. We don't have any conception of how wealthy this industry oh, is. That, that's and how, how, how evilly ingenious they are. They're, they're, they're geniuses, but they're evil. Now, tobacco's not evil. Cigarettes are not evil. Tobacco grows are not evil. But for 50 years, the tobacco industry fought tooth and nail to sell tobacco to children. Yep. More battles over one thing to stop them from selling tobacco to children. That was evil. And my, my latest book is Assassination Generation. It talks about the video game industry fought all the way to the Supreme Court to overturn the California law. California, home of Silicon Valley, home of Hollywood, mm -hmm. overwhelmingly voted to regulate children's access to these violent video games. And the video game industry fought them all the way to the Supreme Court. Yep. 
They said, we have a constitutional First Amendment right to sell any game to any child at any age. You cannot stop us. You cannot regulate us in any way, shape, or form. And they conned seven Supreme Court justices, seven old men who had never played Pong before. Yeah, you're right. They, I, I mean, they had no they, concept. This is this vastly wealthy and yeah. ingenious and evil industry. And they, and they conned them, and they overturned the California law. Today, I believe we're the only major industrialized nation on the planet that doesn't regulate children's access to violent video games. And, and, and I'm not a big guy on laws, mm-hmm. but they would buckle their baby in their car seat if it wasn't the law. Yeah. And I'm that law. You know, if you'd have told my mom, buckle those five kids up, she said it wasn't possible. It became <laughs> like, not done. You know, when it comes to laws saying you can't have sex with my grandkids, I'm good with that. Yeah. But laws saying you can't sell alcohol, tobacco, firearms, or drugs, or automobiles to my grandchildren, I'm good with that. And most people are. But when it comes to laws saying you can't sell these sick, violent games to, to children, that, that, that's where the industry is evil, and to overturn that law. So uh, the, the dynamic effect I want you and everybody here to know is so important is the chronic sleep deprivation. Mm-hmm. And we have an explosion of suicide across our whole nation. You know, later on, if we get a chance, let's talk about PTSD in our troops, because there is a yep. horrendous misrepresentation of our troops. About 5% of the troops in Iraq and Afghanistan contract PTSD. There's just, there, I keep running at veterans who think there's something wrong with them because there's nothing wrong with them. Yeah. The myth of veterans that they're homicidal, suicidal, PTSD-riddled nutcases where the truth is just the opposite. You know, you, you've heard 22 veterans a day take their life. But how many people know that of those 22, only one or two are from the current war? Yeah. Of course there's other veterans. Of course there's other wars. Yep. That they want to think it's all from the current war. It's anti-war propaganda. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. You know, there's too many. But in our military, we study every suicide intensely. And our suicides have nothing to do with combat. A non-combat vet is as like to take the life as a combat vet. Our suicides have a lot to do with sleep deprivation. A sleep deprived person can be up to five times more to take their life. Really? Now, across the world, we have an epidemic of sleep deprived children. Cell phones, social media, video games. Oh, yeah. And across the world, without fail, we have an epidemic of teenage suicides. Now, the new factor in the equation, we always knew alcohol and suicide were related. Alcohol creates impaired judgment. You make a bad decision, they get a chance to rethink it. Yeah. After 18 hours without sleep, your impaired judgment equal to point only legally gone. After 24 hours without sleep, your impaired judgment equal to above legally drunk, point one up. After two nights without sleep, you're psychotic. Yeah. Any graduate of Army Rangers school will tell about hallucinations on the third day without sleep. Oh, yeah. Yep. So here we are, you know, and, and it, a cop told me, I'll just give you one case study that makes it all come alive. A cop told me, I said, I had a, he said, I had a good girl. He said, she was an A student. She said, Dad, it's embarrassing. You don't have to take my cell phone every night. You can trust me. So I trusted her. A little while later, she took her life. Oh, man. So, and, and I never knew the hell. My little girl was living in until we looked at the text messages on her cell phone. Yeah. Night after night of ceaseless, relentless, vicious bullying. Yeah. And she's up all night long trying to defend herself, trying to find somebody that will stand up for her. He said, my little girl was sleep deprived and bullied to death. And I let it happen. He said, I can't ignore that text message. Yeah. He said, the one thing on earth I could have done for my little girl was take her cell phone every night and let her turn off all the bad things in this world. We have got to take our, when we send our kids to bed at night, no cell phone, no laptop, no, they have got to go to their bed and sleep. sleep. And, and traffic fatalities are up. Decade after decade, oh. populations up, traffic fatalities down, airbags, seatbelts, mm-hmm. uh, medical technology. And now traffic fatalities, especially team fatalities, are up. Truck drivers require to log enough sleep for a darn good reason. And, and if your kid is going to be behind the wheel, you make sure they got a good night's sleep the night before. Oh, yeah. Truck overdose. The drugs are not really new. What we have is impaired judgment. Yeah. Making life and death decisions on 
Uh, and, and so we got the three major killers of our kids are, are depending on who you ask, it varies, but the three major killers are, are drug overdoses, traffic accidents, and suicides. And suicide probably be a number one. And all three of them, sleep deprivation is a critical component. So here's this evil industry who fought all the way to the Supreme Court to prevent any regulation whatsoever in their on it. The Parkland killer was uh, was a video game. Yeah. The, the neighbor said he played violent video games 15 hours a day. Oh. Isn't that important? Isn't that worth putting on the news? The all-consuming, all-pervasive thing in this kid's life, the neighbor said it was kill, kill, kill on the video games all day long. Yeah. Isn't it worthy of putting in the news? And, and, and now we've got this killer in Texas, another school killer. And once again, he's an avid video game. Yeah. So, Oh, I, I, I'm at the, the president's round table. There's uh, the president, very gracious and impressive guy in person. Mm-hmm. We are sitting at the table uh, in, in the, in the, on the conference room right next to the Oval Office in the White House. Uh, we, had, uh, we had Senator Rubio there. I, 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 we had uh, two representatives, uh, House of Representatives. Uh, we, we had um, Brent Bozell is one of the leaders in the, in the anti-media violence and mm-hmm. six top people in the video game industry. And the president said people are deeply concerned about these games. His Parkland killer, he played video games 15 hours a day. He said, what can we do about this? And the industry said nothing. We don't have to do it. Of course. You can't make us do nothing. And, and they said the Supreme Court, you got, they got a Supreme Court justice saying there's no scientific evidence, video games, uh, uh, cause violence in our society. And I told him, sir. <laughs> You're not a scientist. <laughs> he said, I, I said, you know, here's the current statement. That as of the last year for the American Psychological Association, violent video games in children raise blood pressure. They raise their heart rate. They create violent fixation and ideation and create violent behavior as reported by the kids and their teachers. I, and, and I turned to this guy. I said, you don't really believe your own propaganda. You know what you had to do to con a bunch of old men who never played Pong in their life? You know what you, that manipulation you went through? Yep. Don't make your own propaganda. You know darn well that you've got blood on your hands and oh, you're yeah. going to be held accountable someday. Now, this industry is enormously wealthy and evil, and, and, and they don't like me much at all. I, I, uh, I slid a copy of my book across the table with the President of the United States. Yeah. Um, my book is at, slid it, I gave one to Senator Rubio, gave it to the representatives. I said, sir, it's all in the book. Slid it across the table to him. I said, the, the, the Supreme Court decision, the dissenting opinions, the medical research, it's all there. These people have blood on their hands. And, and as we love our kids and we love our way of life, we, we got to hold them accountable. So... Afterwards, you know, we, we we all get in the Oval Office. We get a photograph with the president, you know, in the Oval mm-hmm. Office, shake his hand. Oh, yeah. Really. And I was the last one. Yeah, and his wife, Melania, was there. Mm-hmm. Very gracious and beautiful woman. Yeah. And I'm the last one. And he looks at his wife and points at me and said, Colonel, a brave man, very brave man, the president of the United States. And the oval losses. <laughs> you know, I mean, you and I are patriots. We go you know, to our graves believing that that is one of the greatest achievements of our lifetime, you know? And this industry is mercilessly attacking. Well, let me uh, just, Dave, let me just say that. Uh, what he said was, I, w- I was thinking the same thing. You're a very brave man because, you know, that's a huge, huge stake that they have in this. And. That they say, you know, they've got this. They've got this attack page that they send out to people. Yeah, it's, Grossman's a phony. Grossman <laughs> claims he's a ranger, and he's never been assigned to a ranger unit. This is what makes you an army ranger. The ranger tab, That's right, right. Here. They graduate from ranger school. It's called the ranger battalion because it's filled with people who wear the ranger tab. Yep. Go to the army ranger association. Look at what you have to do to be a member. Just being a member of the ranger battalion in peacetime. Uh, yeah. For limited periods of time, does not qualify to be a member of the Army Ranger Association. That very first requirement is to graduate from Ranger School, and you are from yeah. that point on qualified to be a life member of the Army Ranger Association. Yeah, so absolutely, these idiots, these idiots wouldn't know an Army Ranger from a Park Ranger. Oh, for gosh! But sakes. they're in attack mode, learning, and they will do anything they can 
to destroy anybody who stands in their way. And, and I looked at the president and I thought, I wouldn't want to make this guy mad. You know, I, I would find some concession. I, I, I would say, well, we'll get a panel and we'll get back with you. No, we don't have to do nothing. You can't make us do that. They're very polite. But uh, I hope the president comes after him. Now we have two yeah. major massacres. Both of them are video gamers. I, I hope with all my heart the president comes at him. And, and, I, and I hope he'll remember. I hope he'll remember me. And uh, let me help in the process of defeating this evil industry. Again, the games are not evil. The people are not evil. Selling the games to children, children. is evil. Yeah. These, these, these suicides, these traffic accidents worldwide, and especially now in America, we're the only developed nation that doesn't regulate children's access to these violent video games. Uh, more and more, we're going to pay the price. A, a crime identical to Parkland happened in Germany. A 19-year-old high school dropout, 2002, Erfurt, mm-hmm. Germany, comes into school and murders 17 people, including himself. The exact same crime. Yeah. That 19-year-old high school dropout comes into school and murders Germany with yeah. European laws. That these 19-year-olds at Erfurt and the 19-year-old at Parkland, they don't qualify for our juvenile hit parade. Right? They're not juveniles. Yeah. The all-time record juvenile mass murder in history is 2009 in Finland in Germany. But a 17 year high school student murdered 15. Yeah. Germany has some of the strictest gun laws in Europe, and yet a crime identical to Parkland happened in Germany. Germany has the strictest gun laws in Europe, and yet the all time record juvenile mass murder, the all time record school massacre by a juvenile was in Germany. So the industry. That the, the cause is the same. They've got to point the finger yep. somewhere else, and they point it to the guns. Oh, it's all the evil guns. If we just said those yeah. European gun laws, this wouldn't be happening. That's not true. Look at Mexico. Mexico's eaten alive with violence. Yeah. They, you go, go, go to the website, go to online and Google the, the 20 most homicidal nations on the planet. And every one of the top 20 most violent nations on the planet have those gun laws. It's going to make us so safe. Yep. Uh, uh, Afghanistan and Iraq don't even make the top 20 <laughs> nations on the planet more violent, including Mexico, than Iraq and Afghanistan put together. Wow. So you know, just recognize that this evil industry has got to point the finger somewhere else. And they've got to try to deflect it from themselves. The sick movies, the sick TV shows, and especially the sick video games worldwide are creating a sick, sick culture. As we love our kids, as we love our way of life, at least take that stuff away from them, send them to bed, and let them get a good night's sleep. Yeah. Well, you know, the thing is, like I said uh a bit ago, the cause is the same in all of these uh, disparate uh, uh, incidents, and I, I don't know how long. How many times do I have to 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 try and put a square peg in a round hole before I realize this ain't going to work? This is these two things don't coexist and shouldn't be able to be put together. It's the same thing with those games. And and honest, this is an uphill battle. But uh, you must have made quite an impression on the president. Uh, for him I to say so. those words to you, and and I can only hope to God that he, that he'll move as fast on some of those things as he seems to be moving on on a lot of the other things. Uh, you know, every piece of technology had to be digested. Mm-hmm. Think about it. We had automobiles for fifty years before some genius said, "You know, kids probably shouldn't be driving these things." <laughs> what an idea! You know, it took fifty years. So our society is digesting new technology. But the problem is the automobile industry embraced regulation. Yeah. They said, you're right. We should regulate children's access to cars. This industry followed a different path. They followed the path of the tobacco industry, fighting tooth and nail every step of the way yep. to sell the product to children. And, and that will forever mark them as, as evil. Evil, yeah. Uh, I, and, I have this, no qualms about using that label for those, for those well, people in that industry. But in the meanwhile... You know, we, we, we're raising We're the our bad sheep. guys. <laughs> oh, you know, it, it, and, and if, if you, if, you know, you look in your magic ball, you know, you look in your magic crystal. I told you, you know, violence, a hyperviolent Latin American model coming at us, the homicide rates exploded for two years straight. But the American public will rise to the challenge. They'll arm themselves. Eventually, we'll figure this stuff out. We've got some bad years in front of us while we sort this stuff out. What's in your crystal ball? When Ernie Emerson looks at the future, where, where do you see coming down the road? Well, you mentioned it earlier, and, and uh, one of the things that 
I'm concerned with is because my son is, is still in high school and I've got now two grandchildren that will be coming up uh, through, through the school system is, you know, I always relate it to like this. It, it, is it going to happen here? I don't know. It's like winning the lottery. Somebody does win every single time. So it's just a random s- sequence of events that lead up to someone going on a campus and, and doing violence against these children. Uh, what, what I'm seeing is, I think, a slow crack in the egg that's awakening uh, us to, and, and, even, and even people that might not be a, uh, uh, a gun, pro-gun person, that we need, to, we need to have our schools protected, and we need teachers that are trained up in order to yes. protect these children, because they're going to protect them. If they That's, have to throw themselves in front of a uh, they will, they will, of them, they will do it. You know, the first two to die at Sandy Hook, you know, uh, uh, at first two to die were the principal, a female, and another female administrator that charged the killer. One yeah. principal told me, he said, I will die for my kids right now. Yep. Give me something beside my keys in my hand uh, when okay. the time comes. You know, so let me give some info, you and your yeah. listeners. I think you'll find this of value. You know, after the uh, the Parkland massacre, and, and again, they're not shootings; they're massacres. Yep. Hundred uh, percent. Did we lose Camo here, Ernie? I think I'm on. I hear you. I think we just froze up. I think we lost Camo. Oh, oh, I can hear you. Uh, do you hear me at all? There you. Go. Yeah. Well, now we're back to here. Okay. That's the Parkland massacre. The president suggested armed educators. Yeah. And the media. Uh, absolutely devastated them. That's just the stupidest thing I've ever heard about. But they do a little reporting. Here's the news. I do a lot of work in Utah. I do not believe there's a single school left in Utah that doesn't have the armed educators. It's going to a great success. Uh, still there, Ernie? Yeah, I'm still here. I'm listening. And you know, I, uh, I, uh, 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 Ohio, uh, 85% of all the counties in Ohio have some armed educators, and it costs them nothing. The educators had the guns. The educator had the ammo. The training was provided for free. Uh, look up Dick Caster and Faster. It's an acronym. F-A-S-T-E-R oh. and Faster, C-A-S-T-E-R, and his Faster program that he's training across Colorado and across uh, across Ohio. And it, and it cost them nothing. Uh, Texas has more and more armed educators all the time. Well, why isn't the news reporting that a good portion of Texas schools had armed educators? This school didn't. Yeah. And, and I think you're going to see a lot more of the schools in Texas go to armed educators. I believe, I, I worked with a school district in Massachusetts, that a, a public school district had armed educators. The superintendent was a veteran, a spec ops guy, and the principal was a veteran and a, and a reserve cop. And it was no brainer for both of them to be carrying guns in their public schools in Massachusetts. I yeah. believe every state in America has some armed educators, except California. Yeah. California had two school districts with armed educators in California. And, and, and this, they passed a law to stop them from doing it. They passed a state law to stop those two school districts from doing it. So other than California, and even in California, I think there's probably some private schools doing it. But we have schools in every state in America with armed educators. We can do it for free. We can do it immediately. Uh, the president's immediate answer was based on good data, good facts, good information. Oh, yeah. Why can't the media do a little reporting and give us some information on that? Well, they're scared of the truth, and you know that for a fact, because the truth doesn't fit their worldview. And uh, I, I want to tell you, uh, it's funny, you brought up Faster. I've got a gentleman named Jim Irvine coming on next Wednesday uh, f- from Faster. Federal. Yeah, we're going to talk all about that. Faster, they put that together. Uh, and I'm all for it. And I got to tell you, you know, being from northern Wisconsin, and my dad was a teacher, and of course, uh, small town, uh, everybody knew each other. All the teachers uh, deer hunted together and ice fished together and all that. And I know for a fact, uh, I know for a fact that a lot of the cars in the parking lot, not so much the teachers on on campus, so to speak, but there were deer rifles and there were pistols in the trunks or or in those cars, and. No one ever talked about it. No one ever knew about it. And again, it was at a time when these these shootings weren't being reported all over the the, the uh, media like they are. But I'll guarantee you that uh, I grew up on a campus that was it was an armed campus, just because of where I was. And there was never a danger of anybody 
being accidentally shot. And one thing, i got to say this, too. One of the arguments, because I've had this discussion, and people say, well, what do you want? You want someone all of a sudden uh, opening fire when there's kids around and all that against a bad guy? And, I, and I, my uh, answer to that is, what do you think happens when the police arrive? They open fire. The kids are still around. Uh, you know, a straight yeah. bullet, yes. Is there a possibility that it could do harm to an innocent? Yeah. But somebody has to stop that guy. And, and I've always said this, too. If I'm engaging a, the bad guy, he's not picking and choosing where he wants to shoot. Now he's defending himself, and hopefully I'm going to prevail on that. So uh, I, I don't know how else to uh, – it just seems like such common sense. Why don't they get it? Yeah. And, and they are, slowly but surely. The problem is that, again, we, you know, the media has got to point the finger somewhere else. The idea that sick movies and sick TV shows, and especially the sick video games, the idea that visual violent imagery needs to be regulated, it absolutely offends them. And they will do whatever they can to point the finger somewhere else. And where they want to point the finger is at the guns. They won't tell us that Germany had crimes worse than what's happened here with their European gun laws. They won't tell us that the 20 most violent nations on the planet all have those great gun laws. They won't tell us all the states that have armed educators. But the American public are going to find out that, that, that that's a great thing. They no longer have a, a lock on news. They got podcasts yeah. like you. They got people like you doing your podcast, getting the information out to the American people, going around these uh, these roadblocks in our information system and getting the, the truth out there. So believe in what you're doing with these podcasts. Believe in what you do as a fellow sheepdog and the warrior renaissance, my brother, and, <laughs> and, and keep up the good fight. And every one of your people out there believe that our nation needs you at this time to go out there and fight the good fight and get the news out there well uh, thank you for that I, I i'm telling you we are surrounded by good people uh, the guys that uh that we have in in our camp uh they are some of the finest and uh i feel very comfortable around all of my friends in, in the world that that i exist in as i'm sure you do uh and all we have to do is we just have to continually uh, keep the pressure on because the minute, you know, again, it comes down to the old uh, Edmund Burke, uh, you know, all, it, all that's needed for evil to succeed is for good men to do nothing. I probably butchered it, but it's the same exact principle against these entities that are out there that are pushing uh, to, uh, I don't know, I, they're trying to make us into some kind of androids of, with no sexual uh, 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 gender and no uh, free will and all of that. And, and I don't get why, what could possibly be the good in that and why would anyone ever subscribe to that kind of a, uh, uh, an agenda. But it's that they, they don't sleep. It happens 24 hours a day and they inch away and chip away at all of our stuff. And, uh, you know, we... We as conservatives, or the silent majority, I guess, uh, you know, we're. It takes a lot to get us riled up, but once we start moving, it's it's the same thing. When when remember when um, the uh, Yamo, Yamamoto said, uh, "I I fear we have awakened a sleeping giant and filled him with a terrible resolve." Well, we're that terrible resolve to them, and uh, I, I just. I feel good when I can have a conversation with somebody like you uh, who, who really sees through the chaff and, and has done the, the time and effort to deal with statistics, to deal with the, the hard, cold facts that aren't, they can't be skewed. In other words, uh, like you said about the murder rate, uh, yeah, you could hide a whole bunch of stuff behind the fact that the murder rate's going down. But again, it's because of our medical technologies that's, that's skewing that number. The violent assaults, I'm sure. In, in spite of that, when it explodes for two years straight, like nothing we've ever seen before, then they're, they're, you know, they're lying. Well, that's like they, a double, yeah. Yeah. All of a sudden, the, the whole thing turns around on them. So have faith, you know, that it's the worst of times, it's the best of times. Your courage <laughs> and your competence and your, 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 your skills shine bright for the darkness of the hour. Well, okay. Well, I'll tell you, Dave... Uh, Let's do this. I would I would love to have uh, another conversation with you. Uh, uh, we've we've covered a lot of ground here. I would like to ask you to do uh, one thing before we go, though, for sure. Please uh, tell me the books that you've authored, uh, the name of your website, and where we can get some of those things, because I'm sure a lot of people are going to be very interested in this stuff. You know, uh, uh, 
let me start by one other thing we've got going on. My son is a master gunsmith, uh, and we've got sheepdogknifeandgun.com. And we've got, uh, he's got, he's got eight patents. And Come on. Uh, we, he's a smarty we've pants. Got the trig- yeah, yeah, he's a sharp kid. <laughs> you got that trigger finger index point, enhanced slide poles. Uh, there's some neat things happening there. So uh, sheepdogknifeandgun.com. My website is killology.com, K-I-L-L-O-L-O-G-Y.com. And uh, my, my, my books, uh, as I said, uh, On Killing, On Combat, Now Assassination Generation, uh, a lot of others out there. The two Sheepdog Kids books uh, might be the most important thing I've ever done. I, you know, the, the first uh, Sheepdog, Meet Americans, Warriors, and then the second one is uh, Why Mommy Carries a Gun. And uh, they will rock your world, and they rock your little one's world. And, uh, and uh, th- those are great resources we can put out there, too. We, we commend your attention. Well, we're going to list all those up on our on our website uh, here, uh, Colonel, and uh, do what we can to make sure that uh, other people get a chance to to read. Do you still have uh, Do you have any of your lectures or anything online uh, available for people to hear? Yeah. Well, USCCA, U.S. Concealed Carry Association, great people that are doing good things. They have a, a video of my my bulletproof mind video, focused towards uh, concealed carry. Uh, they've been real successful with that. It's a great resource. I uh, there are gobs of videos of me on YouTube. Mm-hmm. You know, there was one uh, there was a, a documentary that tried to take me down about you know, uh, and uh, and all it did was was backfire on me. <laughs> one of the one of the anti cop documentaries, and all it did was backfire on him. And I've, I've let just any documentary, pe- anything mm-hmm. people put on YouTube, I let stay there. Yeah. And uh, and um, and just kind of hold it in open hand, have faith in the good people out there putting the right things out there and looking at the right things and directing people to it. But you go to just about any of those videos on YouTube that are being watched, and uh, you'll, you'll 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 see some pretty good stuff out there. Well, I guess that might be the law of unintended consequences. Huh? <laughs> it's the free market. You know, have some faith that left their own devices, uh, millions of people out there, cheap dogs in the free market. You know they. Uh, you know, I, I talk about give you an angle on this, Ernie. It's kind of uh, I, I I talk about how people respond to a life and death event. I tell them, you know, that my fire guys tell me, my EMS guys tell me, my cops tell me, you know, uh, a, a life and death event. Uh, and they get home that night, and uh, and they have some really intense sex. It's a powerful drive to reproduction in the face of death. Yep. And there's nothing wrong if it doesn't happen. It'd be surprised how much it does happen, and it scares people. And I tell people there's not a whole lot of, no, not a whole lot of, you know, perks that come with this lifestyle. You find one, <laughs> <real life. laughs> take and, advantage uh, of it, right? <laughs> and, uh, and and so uh, they took a, a a video of that and they edited it and edited. It. Look at all the edits in it, mm-hmm. and they basically come out with Grossman saying, after you kill somebody, you're going to have a, you're going to have great sex. Oh, for God's and, uh, sakes. And, uh, and they, they they cut everything else out, and, and you can look at all the little edits in it. You know, every little clip taken out of context is a potential lie. Oh yeah. Every edited yeah. clip, the lie is you know is it, it's exponentially greater. It's a lie to the second, third, fourth, and fifth order. Every time you see uh, uh, every time you see a, a, a piece sliced out, well, people see that and and they laugh about it, and uh, and it actually did more good than harm when they take that little clip. And of course, all the anti cop people are horrified by it. Oh my God! Everybody else, gets, everybody else gets a kick, gets a out, kick of it out. Says, "I want to see more. I, I want to see more from this guy Grossman. What? What, what are they leaving out? <laughs> what, what is the nonsense?" So uh, you know, the, in, in the end, you know, um, the YouTube and uh, and 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 uh, you know, the books on Amazon.com. You know, but my my books, uh, Sheepdog and uh, and Why Mommy Carries a Gun, would probably never go in the local Barnes and Noble. But, uh, <laughs> they're they're doing great on Amazon.com. So we've we managed to uh, to find a way to get around the, uh, you know, there used to be three networks yeah. controlled everything, and and now thank God we have Fox, but sometimes they're they're a little too balanced for me. I think they go too far on the other side, trying hard to be balanced. That uh, the yeah, CNN yeah. has lost any pretense of being balanced, which oh, is yeah. a victory. It's really a victory. But um, have, have faith that uh, YouTube and Amazon and and that great body that, that the right stuff will float to the top. A lot of goofy stuff floats out there. A lot of Crazy stuff floats out there, but but trust the American people, trust our way of life, trust the the free market and free enterprise to get the right tools and the right skills, and above all else, 
Uh, trust the American people to vote the right way in the long run. Yeah. Look at shouts who concealed carry in 43 states. Look at California going county by county. You know, hold California up in prayer these next elections. There may be a real surprise coming. If, there could if not be. then, surely, surely by the next presidential elections, you'll see that tide turn. Uh, have faith in our nation and uh, and, uh, and God bless you, Ernie Emerson, for all that you do to guide us down that path. Well, Colonel Grossman, thank you very, very much. And, and again, thank you for all the good work that you do. Uh, we all owe you a, uh, a tremendous uh, thank you and a debt. And uh, i got to just tell you this, uh, because I've been involved with all the Navy SEAL teams for a long, long time, I know that you used to go down to uh, Coronado and certain uh, places and give them a run-up uh, kind of a speech or whatever before these guys were getting ready to deploy and i've spoken to a bunch of them uh you are held in the highest esteem and uh, a lot of them made comments that thank goodness i had uh grossman's talk before we went into combat because it changed it changed what i did in combat and it brought me back home to my wife and kids so how can how can anyone ever repay that to just say thank you and just keep up the good work thank you Thank you very much. And at this point, I guess we're going to wrap up, Danny. That was that was super interesting. Uh, I could. I, I wish that uh, Colonel Grossman was here uh, and with us, where we could actually sit and have a, a beer and talk about a lot of this stuff for the next four or five hours. But uh, perhaps we'll get a chance to do it again. Uh, so, Dave, uh, we're signing out now. And and thank you very much for for being a guest with us today and taking. Uh, time out of your uh, tight schedule, I'm sure, to spend some time with us. Thank you very, very much. Right. I mean what I said, Ernie. Keep up the great work. We need you, brother. We truly need you. All righty. We'll do that. Bye-bye. Well, Danny, that brings us to the end of another podcast. And I, I'm having some fun with this. Are you? Yeah, it's a lot of interesting topics that were discussed well, I'm trying to get the most interesting people on here we can because I promised everybody it'd be the most interesting people in the world. Uh, maybe we can get the most interesting man in the world. <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> At some time, but uh, we'll see. Uh, I mean, the old most interesting man, not the new most interesting <laughs> man. I think that, that guy sucks. Uh, they blew it when they got rid of the, the dignified uh, gentleman that was playing that part. <laughs> <laughs> And I think it actually made me buy some Dos Equis beer from time to time. So, anyway, uh, for all of you out there, you can support our podcast by subscribing. Uh, you can support it by buying the stuff on the podcast website at ernestemersonpodcast.com. Uh, please leave us a review on iTunes, like us on Facebook, and follow us on Instagram and Twitter. And you can find uh, the Ernest Emerson Podcast on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, and uh, all the other places where you you can access with your um, podcast apps. And you can also subscribe on YouTube. Just search the Ernest Emerson Podcast. Uh, and as always, you can find all of the podcasts and everything else we offer on our website, ErnestEmersonPodcast.com. And... Once again, I need to thank our sponsors, The Order of the Black Shamrock. Find out about them at theorderoftheblackshamrock.com. And Royce, excuse me, <laughs> I knew I'd do that someday. Hoist Gracie Jiu-Jitsu South Bay. They can be found at hoistgracysouthbay.com. And once again, I also need, we all also need to thank all the men and women on the front lines, wherever they may be, who are the warriors and protectors for all of the rest of us. May God bless and protect our soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, Coasties, and all those who wear the badge or are the first responders. Without your bravery and sacrifice, we would, with certainty, have never become the greatest nation in the history of mankind. And none of us would ever be able to sleep soundly in our beds at night. And that's all for tonight, folks. So I'll see you later, Danny, and I'll see all of you out there who are now listening to our podcast. Signing up. <laughs>